<laughs> but I will certainly do my best for you today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and in just a moment pull up a presentation, but I, I also wanted to second Harriet's thanks for your coming today. Um, as you're working through your degree, there just can often be kind of surprising ramifications on financial aid if you are struggling at all or even just have a bad semester. Uh, so it's really important that you kind of hear this and know about this uh, moving forward. So I'm really glad that you came. I'm gonna hopefully get this to share successfully, Harriet. Fingers crossed. Sometimes Google Meet, I find, is a little funky. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my entire screen. And hopefully that will work for everybody. Is the presentation visible? Yes, I see it. Okay. I see it. Thank you. Because now, of course, I won't also see. <laughs> if anyone asks a question, I won't be able to see it because I'm sharing my whole screen. But. Um, Feel free to ask, of course, as we go along. I'm going to pause at a couple of spots uh, in case there are questions you'd like to ask kind of while we're talking about something. And then naturally, we'll have time at the end as well uh, to talk about those things, too. Okay. And with that, we can get going. Talking about SAP. Um, you will hear me usually refer to it as SAP. SAP refers to Satisfactory Academic Progress. Um, this terminology is actually a federal term. Uh, although it is used commonly in academic worlds as well, it is mostly pointing to a very specific area of federal law. Uh, because the federal student financial aid programs are premised on the idea of someone getting to complete uh, a degree or a certificate program, um, it's also premised on the idea that not only will you complete that program, but that you should be completing it within a certain time frame, whatever that might be. For instance, a bachelor's degree, typically they're expecting four years to be um, that maximum time frame. So all of the rules around measuring SAP are about ensuring that a person can complete the program in that designated amount of time. And so we're assuming you're meeting certain conditions along the way of return to get yourself there to help finish your degree. This website that you see here at the bottom, this is just from the UNLV website that talks a little bit about what the university's policies are, just FYI. And to um, hurry, we can collect names as well if anyone would like me to send this to them afterwards, happy to do it. The reason this in a federal construct is really important is that since it's measuring someone's progress over time, you know, we're going to school and life has a habit of getting in the way sometimes, uh, and it can derail that progress at any moment along the way. And we're going to talk in just a moment about the three components of SAP, uh, but not meeting any one of those components, those different requirements of SAP can mean a loss of federal financial aid eligibility and also some uh, state and institutional aid as well. So it doesn't necessarily take a lot uh, for something to kind of trigger one of these issues with SAP. And that's why it's so important that we know about it. There are three primary elements when we talk about satisfactory academic progress that we are measuring along the way. One being pace, which I'll explain in a moment, a grade point average, which probably requires no explanation, and the maximum credits that are allowed to take on your way to that degree. So let's talk a little bit about PACE first. Uh, we even, I think on our website, call it completion rate in a number of uh, places. And I think you might see it elsewhere too with that terminology, but PACE and completion rate are the same thing. What we're really looking at is the percentage of courses that you're taking that were successfully completed. So essentially were completed all the way with any grade other than a failing grade or some other non-passing grade. So at UNLV withdrawals, for example, will not count as completed because withdrawing assumes that you didn't finish the course. Other non-passing grades besides failing grades, such as incompletes, things like that, 
uh, are not counted as completed and passed when we're looking at your PACE. We do at UNLV, uh, for better or worse, include transfer credits in that calculation. So if you've transferred in um, a certain number of courses, those contribute to your PACE as well. And to give you an example, you can just see toward the bottom of the slide. If you took 15 credits in a term, but you withdrew from one of them, for example, so you completed 12 credits out of 15 credits, uh, so four classes out of five, that would leave you with a pace of 80%. The minimum required pace at UNLV is 70. So just under three quarters of your courses. GPA, of course, is something that you know. The, the base standard for undergraduate students is a 2.0. For grad students, it's a 3.0. And I thought it was important to mention uh, this last point here about pass-fail or satisfactory, unsatisfactory grades, uh, as we are allowed to do that now because of the COVID emergency. Those, those grades do not count toward your GPA. They will still count as attempted. Uh, if you have an S or pass, it would account, count as attempted and completed. If you have a fail or U, it would count as attempted but not completed. However, it will always be excluded from the calculation of your grade point. So this can be an advantage. This is why we have it during the emergency here. Um, if it has been a difficult term, if you've been impacted by COVID and that has hindered your ability to get your schoolwork done uh, or make progress, Having an SU grade, even if you end up with a U, um, might affect your pace, but at least you know that your grades, your grade point is safe. So it's a good mechanism to have in place um, if you're having a bad time right now because of COVID. And last but not least, looking at maximum credits. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that SAP is based on this principle of completing a program in a certain amount of time. Um, in our case, when we're talking about time, we're actually talking about credits. Uh, so that for a bachelor's degree, our maximum time frame right now is set at 186 credits. And what this really means is that by the time you hit 186 credits, you should have, quote unquote, should have completed your bachelor's degree. Certain other programs may have different time frames, as they are often tied to the length of the program. Um, the federal rule is actually 150%. This is where the 186 credit hours is coming from, um, that a student can't take more than 150% of the length of a program to complete it. So that 186 happens to be 150% of the average number of credits that someone would need for a bachelor's degree. So those didn't just come out of nowhere, but that's the standard. And that's why, too, if you have a different program, like a teacher licensure program, for example, why it's a much different credit hour limit of 58, because that's 150% of the program length. Excuse me. So again, any, any of those components um, can impact your progress and therefore can impact your eligibility for aid of all kinds. Um, let's sort of talk a little bit now that we know these three elements of SAP, what the process is of our reviewing your progress, and then if you were ever struggling in a given semester or year, kind of what, how that process unfolds for you and how we can work with you on it. In terms of the SAP reviews, effectively, we're going to do a review after every term that you enroll in, um, waiting, of course, for grades to post. <laughs> so we will do this at the end of a term. Your status will follow you if you have to take a term or two off and then come back. Um, so for this example that's here in front of you, if you enroll in fall but had to take spring off for whatever reason, then you come back in summer, your status that was determined at the end of fall is just going to carry forward to when you come back in summer. So you'll just stay in a given status until you come back. When we are performing a SAP review at the end of that term, um, we are looking at all three of those elements. So we're checking your pace, checking your GPA, and checking how many credits you've completed. Um, and again, unfortunately, any one of them not being met, the 70% 70, 70 uh, pace, the 2.0 if you're an undergraduate GPA, or that you are not exceeding 186 credits, technically speaking, you will actually lose your eligible eligibility for federal and possibly other types of aid. But 
One nice flexibility that we have, and this is actually a federal flexibility, is what's called a warning period. All warning is, is that it's a warning. Uh, you haven't met SAP, say, in one given term. So when you're going into that next following term, let's say you didn't meet SAP in fall, so now you're entering the spring term. By being in warning, this means that we can extend your federal aid eligibility for one term automatically. There's nothing that you need to do to have this period of time. So this is a wonderful thing because it means you have that term. If you had a difficult term prior, you have this time now to try to make things better, improve your GPA or whatever it is you might need to do uh, without having to request it or anything like that. A nice thing about warnings also is if you go into a warning period and then after that warning term, uh, you are again making satisfactory academic progress, but two, three, four terms later, something happens and you have a bad semester and you can fall into another warning. There's no limit to the number of warnings <laughs> that you can have. Uh, you just can't have them two in a row, but you can come in and out uh, as needed. And I, I bring that up because especially the last two years, um, you know, people have faced a lot of challenges, not just in one term, but sometimes more than one term, uh, or things were challenging and then back on track and then faced new challenges. So it's good that the warning exists. It's kind of an immediate grace to try to pull things back together again to move forward. But if, if you have a warning term and at the end of it, grades are in and you're still not meeting the uh, satisfactory ac academic progress requirements, then we would start an appeal process with you. So doesn't mean that you can't have aid, just means that you have to actually appeal for it. We do have a format on our website, which I'll, I'll show you the link to in just a moment. Um, that appeal essentially allows for continuation of federal aid if it's approved for one more additional term. So if we go back to my previous example, let's say that you didn't meet the requirements as of the end of fall, spring would be your warning period. If you chose to enroll in summer and you appealed and it was approved, uh, then you could also then receive aid for summer um, to continue to give you that time to come back into sanding. We would generally need you to work with your advisor to establish an academic plan which is really meant to just sort of outline for yourself what courses are remaining that you need to take and also try to try to see what might be standing in your way and plan your studies accordingly to just maximize uh, your ability to be successful. So I'm just to kind of just reiterating the same point a couple of times here, but that it really doesn't take much to put your aid in jeopardy when it comes to SAP. Um, and there are a couple of really common scenarios. Two of them you can see here on the screen, especially if you are a brand new student. So if you're coming in, it's your first year in college ever um, at UNLV, something happens like a family emergency and you have to withdraw from half of your courses, that means your pace is 50%. That's after just one term. Similarly, something could come up, even the same thing could come up and you try to stay and finish all of your courses and you do, but maybe you fail to because you're really not able to focus entirely on them because of these other things happening in life. That can have a dramatic impact on your GPA. Again, this is especially easy to do when it's early on in your academic time at UNLV uh, because you haven't, you haven't accumulated a lot of credits the more you have completed, the easier it is to maintain pace, et cetera. So uh, easy to do early on, also easy to do if you have transferred in a lot of courses, because those transferred classes do count toward your total attempted credits. Sometimes that puts someone in, transfers in a lot of classes, kind of bumping up against that 186 credits that we talked about for the maximum time. Um, bumping up against those rather early on in their time, long before they're going to be done with their program here. So those are cases that we see a lot. And I really want to stress too, because we talk about you're making progress, I want to be very clear that that isn't really about judgment. Um, things really do happen. And what we want to do in our office is hopefully facilitate your being back on track so you can get to finish that program 
stuff happens. And sometimes I think the rules, when we're reading rules, almost sounds like um, imposing a judgment because you didn't succeed. And it really is not what it's about. Um, it's just a fact of life that stuff gets in the way sometimes. So let's say you had your warning term. Maybe you made some progress, but didn't fully meet those SAP requirements just yet. So you appealed, it was approved, you received aid for one additional term. If at the end of that, you still have not met the requirements, you can continue to appeal. Um, and I'm gonna actually, I'll just move right forward now to talk about the process and what kind of makes a good appeal for us. Uh, I just want to stress that we really do want to help you through the process because we want you to finish your program. That's really the ultimate goal here. Um, we want the same thing. So although we can never guarantee that one will be approved, we really want to make it as easy as possible for you. Uh, to complete, I mentioned that form earlier, you can find on the website at unlv.edu slash finaid slash forms. Uh, under a uh, subtopic of appeal forms, there is a SAP appeal form there that you would need to submit and upload to us in the self-service health center with any other documentation that you might want to have accompanying it. And these are really the things that we most want to see and understand in an appeal. Uh, because we know things happen and get in the way, we just want to hear what it was that got in the way. And hopefully, hopefully it's been able to be resolved. Um, how those things have been resolved and what your plan is moving forward. That's really it. Again, things come up. So just understanding what those things were, have you been able to address them or have they since been resolved altogether? And how are you going to move forward from that? Um, kind of the gold standard too of an appeal, if it's possible, is to provide some kind of third party document documentation. So if it was a medical issue that you were struggling with, maybe a note from your doctor, something like that, even a family member can help strengthen, um, strengthen an appeal and increase the chances of it being approved. Um, we do also understand though that sometimes it just isn't really feasible to get third party documentation. Um, of a circumstance, and that's okay too. It doesn't mean that it's absolutely required. It is just encouraged, um, certainly, if it's available to you. Oh, you know what? I'm going to pop back and add one little thing here about strong appeals. As I talked about maybe having warning, appealing, and maybe even needing to appeal again, uh, really there because they're, we're dealing with multiple appeals in a case like that. What keeps them very strong for us uh, is really seeing progress so that maybe the, let's say grades were the issue in one given term. And you know sometimes grades can take a little time to bring that GPA up to the required level. So if you had your warning term and your GPA increased, but maybe didn't get all the way to 2.0, then you appealed and that was approved. And so you had eight again, and maybe you got a little closer to the 2.0, but still weren't quite there yet. That still helps support an additional appeal for you because we see that you're getting closer and making your way. So there's an, a change in your progress that's gonna get you back uh, on track toward completing the program. So that also can strengthen an appeal. Things to remember, uh, courses never go away, <laughs> so to speak, when it comes to SAP. Uh, and I say this because there are academic mechanisms in place, like having an administrative withdrawal from a course may wipe it from your transcript. So that can be good. Let's say you're maybe going out to grad school and you don't want to have a bad semester on your transcript. It's definitely very beneficial from that standpoint. But when looking at satisfactory academic progress, we are required to consider every course you attempt. Um, even if it no longer appears on your transcript. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, also, if you have had a difficult time for a while and trying to get yourself back up into good standing to really think about course load, uh, it can be really easy. I'll just use grades again because it's a, an easy example. Uh, you're trying to improve your GPA, so you want to take as much as you can, get good grades, and bring that back up to 2.0, but sometimes by doing that, it's actually harder to improve your grades because it can be overwhelming or too much at that time. So to really think about what level of enrollment you can successfully manage uh, and do well in with whatever else you might be juggling in your life.
And of course, don't forget that your academic advisors and our counselors here in financial aid are here to help you. Um, don't ever hesitate to consult with us if you have questions. And if you are facing a challenge, um, although it can be hard to talk about, we really recommend you talking to our office about it prior to actually withdrawing from the class, if withdrawal is what you're considering. Um, just so that we can hopefully talk through with you what the possible ramifications are of that before they even happen. And then you can kind of plan accordingly. We can work with you on how to manage that academically, uh, ideally just to minimize there being any problems with SAP, if at all avoidable. And we can coach you then on that. I know I said before that I always want to phrase and talk about SAP in a way that makes it clear this isn't a judgment uh, on having a, a difficult term, just that difficult things happen. Um, because we have things like the warning and appeal process in place, we can actually sometimes see that there is a concern or that you might need help early on. Um, we have financial aid, if we see that uh, early on, we'll try to notify an advisor or reach out to you uh, or other students to just say, hey, what's going on? Uh, can we help? So it can be a good alert that someone might need some support. And weirdly enough, <laughs> this maybe isn't the greatest silver lighting to SAP issues, but um, it does really require some thinking through about what next steps are, uh, what courses do I need to take, kind of at minimum, because we want to finish the program. And ideally, this makes you finish up a little more speedily so that you're hopefully borrowing less. If you're borrowing, uh, it just prevents accumulation of debt or staying in school longer than you need to. So again, just don't hesitate to reach out, please. We, we do most of our communications through um, Self-Service Help Center. Uh, it's a little less personal than a phone call, but we can always, you can always request that we call you or you can call us, but uh, we usually try to do this here so that if there are documents that need to pass back and forth, uh, we can do that there. And also just in case you're working with someone and they end up having to be out unexpectedly for a long time, uh, then someone else can pick up right where they left off and continue to, to provide you service. So uh, we do encourage that to the extent possible. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's also my email address here. If you ever want to reach out to me personally, please don't hesitate. I, if, if I am here, would be happy to help you. And if not, can certainly find someone to help you uh, so that you get the assistance that you need. And with that, here it is. I will stop sharing so I can see you all again. So now that I can see your chat, and of course, you can always unmute yourself too. Uh, anything that you'd like to talk about or any questions that come to mind? There are a lot of just like nitpicky details with SAP. So it can be a little bit complicated. Or for that matter, since we have the time, if there's something related to it that you think I did not cover, please let me know because we do have time to talk about it. Seth, could you go over the timeline um, like for appealing? I feel like that a lot of times students either don't know about that appeal process or are somewhat um, anxious about actually doing it, right? Um, so mm -hmm. like the timeline for that. Um, certainly what we recommend, and this is another nice thing about having the warning period, uh, just because you're, you're kind of bought that one term automatically uh, where you can continue to receive aid. I would actually go so far as to say, you probably know uh, in a term, well, you certainly know if you withdrew from classes, but you'll also know if you're struggling grade-wise with, with courses that semester, that you can actually begin thinking about it that early on. Um, however, on the upside, although we do usually have a deadline, um, it is not until the middle of the term, typically speaking, it's in October, for example, for this current semester that we're in. So even if you can't do it early, although that's ideal, you can still be submitting it into the term 
um, sometimes this will happen where someone thinks they can just pay on their own uh, and not worry about the appeal and then discover that they, they probably were stretching themselves a little too thin. And so they go ahead and then appeal like in September for fall so that we can still consider it. The advantage of just being early though is just, it's easier to get stuff to us uh, in time. It's easier to collect documentation because you, you have a little time to collect that if you're able to get it. And uh, there was usually a pretty decent volume of SAP appeals that we receive. And so the earlier that, the earlier that we receive it from you, the earlier we can get an answer to you. Uh, so that we can plan accordingly. So if, if we were talking about spring, maybe if spring was a warning period for you uh, and you were thinking about an appeal for fall, ideally having that by maybe June would be great. If after this term, maybe this is a difficult term and or uh, last term rather was, sorry. So that this fall, this current fall is your warning semester if you kind of know toward the end of semester that this might not be good, ideally we would get that from you in December. But again, if you don't, that is not your last option. We still have to, I believe, sometime in February to work with you. For what it's worth, we also really simplified the form. <laughs> That was one of, one of our big and important projects this year was making forms as simple as we possibly could, so. I'm sure, you know, you, you did an excellent presentation, but I can't believe that nobody has any questions. You could feel free to put them in the chat if you like, mm -hmm. if you have any questions. And it's okay too if you don't, but because you know how to find you know how to find us. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And um, we are we are open, and I actually have found a number of people who don't know that we're open. So we are on campus, um, although we're hoping to move. We're we're kind of increasing our staff size and hoping to move to having some extended hours. Um, but we do have our regular hours from eight to five. If you're on campus, you can also pop by. Oh, but eight deadlines? Oh, sure. Um, so the, the the upcoming priority deadline, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I'll start with the actual FAFSA deadline. The FAFSA will open, that's the, the free application for federal student aid. Uh, it is used for determining your eligibility for federal aid, but also some types of state and institutional aid. Uh, so very important to get it in. Our priority deadline is November 15th this year. Um, but the FAFSA will actually be open in 11 days. It will open on October 1st. Uh, and I really encourage as soon as possible after October 1st that you get it in. I know November 15th is the final priority deadline, but as early as early before that as you can, the better just because there are actually some institutional funds and state funds that will run out because they're fixed, kind of fixed buckets of money. Uh, so, and we will go in date order effectively for those who qualify. So really the earlier, the better that you can get it in uh, is helpful. And that this FAFSA cycle that's about to open is for fall 2022. Um, and I always feel like this can be really jarring if, um, if this is like your first term <laughs> because you start and you're immediately applying for the following year. Um, but it also leaves time for us to work with you and hopefully make make the financing aspect of your education um, a little easier just because we have a long runway to get things in order for you. Um, so that is really the importance of getting it in by the priority deadline, kind of maximizing your being considered for as much as humanly possible. Uh, there is, just so you know, the priority deadline is set by UNLV. There is no such no such thing from a federal standpoint. Uh, if you think you can pay yourself and then determine later that you need some assistance, you can complete and submit that FAFSA at any time during the year. Um, for at least federal eligibility, you are always going to be considered for that. So please know that the only advantage of the priority deadline from a federal perspective is that you find out your eligibility earlier. <laughs> so that's a good thing from a planning perspective. But 
So the priority deadline that UNLV sets, right, as I understand what you just said, is for potential consideration of additional kinds of financial aid that might be available here at the university. Yes. Okay. Um, there is also a question in here about in case a student is planning on taking a gap year, what would be the deadline for the SAP appeal deadline? Sure, uh, and they're actually the same. So uh, just to create a story, if if someone was taking this current year away, say they were enrolled by spring, they're taking this year off, but returning fall of 22, uh, whatever your status was at the end of my spring when you were last enrolled would follow you to fall of 2022. So if we were to say that last spring was a difficult semester, and you were going to go into a warning semester, fall of 2022 would be your warning semester. So it will be kind of like you never left. Um, and then like this fall, the deadline would be about halfway through the term. So it would be in October of 2022 uh, as the utmost uh, deadline, but of course the sooner you can do it, the, the better. Um, you might actually have an advantage with a gap year because the FAFSA cycle opens so early uh, and you could apply in October for next fall. You could also submit a SAP appeal for the following fall, almost a full year in advance, and that would also be fine too. So you have a lot of time to do it, but the ultimate cutoff like midterm is going to be the same for you as it would be for anybody else, the term that you're coming back in. I have two more questions. One yeah. is, okay, so if there's a student who, you know, has that they've been taken off their financial aid because of SAP or whatever, whatever that category is, uh, should they still fill out the FAFSA? I would definitely recommend that they do. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, if you choose to appeal, then you're kind of ready to go. Uh, if that's approved, we'll have everything else that we need to move things forward for you. Uh, also, if you happen to be the recipient of an academic scholarship at UNLV, um, that you don't need the FAFSA to, to apply for it in the sense that it might just be based on your academics, not on your financial situation but we do ask for the FAFSA every year for the sake of renewing that scholarship. So filing it by the priority deadline still ensures that you can continue to keep those other types of funds too. And my other question was, and I, I don't know if there's anyone who is on this, this uh, uh, session um, that this may apply or if they might know somebody for whom this applies. I think right. it's probably a good thing. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, the alternative need for? Thank you so much. That's so funny that you say it because I actually had a note to myself to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just glossed right over that. No, that's uh, fine. <laughs> so thank you, Harry. Uh, the alternate need form it, for us, we really treat it as kind of a mirror to the FAPSA. So if, if, uh, if someone is an undocumented student, and we can also use it if you're an international student uh, and therefore ineligible even to complete a FAFSA because you would need a valid social security number just to complete a FAFSA in the first place. So if you're not able to do that, it's going to mirror the FAFSA and that will collect some information from you and determine eligibility for you um, in our own internal process. Uh, if you have heard of the federal Pell Grant, which uh, is it's actually kind of the cornerstone of the federal programs as a grant program for students uh, from families with lower to middle income uh, resources available to them. It mirrors that in the sense that uh, if you would be eligible for the Pell Grant, if you were able to complete a FAFSA, then you can receive need-based aid from us. Thank you. So it's it's kind of a companion. Uh, some good news, if, if anyone here on this uh, on this call 
is going to be completing a, an alternate need form in the coming year, we're actually moving that into self-service. So it will be just an electronic form that you can submit that way, which is Great. much simpler than it used to be. Another question, uh, I am doing poorly in my class now or may have to drop a class. Who should I talk to about my financial aid for spring? How early should I talk to them? This is from Dr. M as a hypothetical question. I was like, that name seems familiar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, if it, I would say by all means, open up a, a case in self-service or pop by our office, or you can call us. I, it's so awful, I have to get the phone number for you. I don't ever call here. Uh, any of those things, but I recommend self-service because I think you might get a, a more full answer that way. But just to ask the question, you can even do that right now. If you think that uh, you will not be very successful in that class or think it might be worth just dropping it at this point, uh, if that will have any effect on your aid. Usually, if you're taking four or five classes and it's just one class that's a concern, that will usually not create enough of a problem to really harm you from a SAP perspective. But never say never, right? Because <laughs> again, if you're taking two classes and one of them is a problem, um, then maybe you're going to be left with a, a pace of 50%. Or if you fail that course, then your GPA gets really, really low um, very quickly. It, like, it doesn't really take necessarily a lot. Or if that drops you to less than half time and you are a recipient of federal student loans, you will go into your grace period and potentially into repayment if you aren't at least half time. So of course you probably want to avoid that as well <laughs> for as long as humanly possible. Absolutely. I myself will be repaying until the day I die, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I just finished mine. No, I'm, I'm Congrats. Really no, it, it, it took a while. It, it took a while. You know. You may remember our last president championing that in office when they finally finished paying off. Yeah, their loan. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He did talk about <laughs> having just paid off his loans. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But but to the group here, and I know I've said that. I'm sorry, I'm saying so many times, um, but I just want to really reinforce talking to us if you think there's going to be an issue, even if you're not sure if there's going to be an issue, um, or think there could be, but you just want some information to help you make a decision about what to do. To um, Dr. Maria Lopez's point, if you're just trying to figure out what your next steps are, having that conversation with us helps ensure, well, if, if you don't succeed in this class, here's what maybe could happen. If you just withdraw from the class, here's what maybe could happen. And it might be that nothing terrible is going to happen, but at least you will be informed enough to make a decision that's going to work best for you. So please don't hesitate. And I, I say it so many times only because, I don't know, I don't really think ours is an office that lots of people want to come talk to. <laughs> Or if they do, it's because something critical has happened. And, and fortunately with SAP, uh, with warning and all of that in place, it gives time for us to actually work through it with you, which is which is great. Sure. We don't always have that luxury, so. Oh, and I just saw an additional question. No, not embarrassing at all, not in the least. And uh, this can be a tricky one to answer. Uh, can everyone, I didn't realize, can everyone see the chat? Or should I read the question? Uh, the question was, what is the difference between academic probation and academic suspension? Uh, and is it possible to appeal if you fall under the latter? And I may have to defer on this one slightly because uh, SAP, as we're talking about, is directly related to your aid, but might be different uh, than what happens on the academic side, depending on what 
program you're in. So someone could be in some programs, in theory anyway, could be on academic probation, but not be at risk of losing their financial aid or the other way around, <laughs> or they could be not meeting the SAP requirements, but would be perfectly fine uh, with their department. Um, I can say the basic distinguish, distinguishing factor here is that probation is sort of like a warning, like some, something isn't working uh, or isn't successful academically speaking, and there will be some requirements attached to that to bring yourself back up into good standing, whereas suspension usually means removal from courses, unfortunately. But to my knowledge, that can usually be appealed if it is strictly an academic issue, or sometimes um, someone will leave and then essentially is readmitted at some future time to, to hopefully have a bit of a fresh start. I, I believe that when a student is actually suspended based upon his or her academics, that that suspension is for uh, one academic year. I believe that that is the case. However, with everything, there is always an opportunity to appeal. And um, I, I will say from an intersection standpoint, uh, we have um, assisted students with developing their paperwork and their appeal um, documents to present for appeals for academic suspension as well as SAP. And so that is something that that we would be more than help more than um, ready to to assist students with who might want to do their appeals. I, we don't guarantee that the appeals will be um, approved, but we can help you with that that um, that process and, and make it a little bit less scary or less intimidating. Well, thank you for providing that kind of support. It, for that very reason, it, it can be very intimidating or overwhelming. And well, and I think that I found that for students that we've helped, right, that they want to, in, in their letters, right, of appeal, they want to throw in the, the kitchen sink, which is understandable, but <laughs> getting folks to understand that it's not the kitchen sink that that committee is going to be concerned about. It is what is it that you feel got you to this point and do you have a, um, a, a mechanism or a system to help you get out of that point? You know, what is it that you're going to do? So yeah, we've been pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much able to help a few students with, with that paperwork. That's great. It can be hard too, of course, because it's, it is not meant to be invasive, but it can sometimes feel a little invasive yeah. because we are asking you to talk about your personal life and what's what's going on with you or your family or whatever the case may be. Um, so please also know it is all in the strictest confidence here. Does anyone have any questions? Any other questions? So. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Zach, would you would you put your contact information because you said that you that they could email you or yeah, who, I, whatever the contact information is? Could you put that in the chat for yeah. us? Um. This way you will have it and, sorry, my mouse just did something crazy. Uh, and if I am not around, which I will be honest, I am often not, <laughs> you might not hear back immediately from me, but someone can be back in touch with you. But I'll always try to answer you um, personally, of course. And sometimes if, if I think it's going to to mean that we need to have some ongoing conversation. I may also open up a self-service case for you uh, on your behalf, uh, just so that that's kind of there in case we need documents or anything like that, so. And I'm gonna put uh, the intersection information in here too. So 
Thank you. We can be also a resource for you. Well, Zach, I want to thank you for uh, doing this uh, reboot for us. I think that the information obviously is extremely important, and I'm sure that those who joined us today will find it uh, helpful. This uh, it was being recorded. It is being recorded, and so we will make that available in a variety of sources, uh, including our uh, the Intersections uh, YouTube channel which will have that and uh, other avenues, including our social media pages. So if um, you know you want to refresh your memories here about what was said, you're able to do that. But as I said, I want to thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, my thanks as well, everyone.